Good morning. My name is Alex Trayman. I'm the director of the documentary film Iranium. I'm uh, here representing today the Clarion Fund, which educates Americans about the very real and growing threats emanating from Islamic extremism. The Clarion Fund's primary educational tool is award-winning, critically acclaimed, powerful, and impactful documentary films. Uh, our films are Obsession, Radical Islam's War Against the West, The Third Jihad, Radical Islam's Vision for America, and Iranium. The films have been seen by over 50 million Americans, have been featured on thousands of mainstream media outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, uh, top 10 radio stations, and uh, print media from the New York Times on down. Uh, Clarion Fund is currently working on producing our next film, uh, which is going to tackle the treatment of women in Islamic societies. This is one of the largest and most underreported human rights crises in the world today, um, and we think it's going to be a very, very powerful film uh, that is following some of the uh, attention that this issue is getting in mainstream media. Our second educational tool is our website, RadicalIslam.org. Uh, the site has received over 500,000 readers in 2012. Uh, we send a newsletter twice a month to over 100,000 subscribers. Uh, the site not only provides encyclopedic information uh, about radical Islam, but also uh, constant news analysis on breaking events uh, in the Middle East and the United States and also encourages action campaigns uh, to challenge radicalism here in the United States. Uh, many have sent letters to their congressmen and to other local officials using our website. And in addition, we also host this webinar series. Uh, this is one of uh, several webinars that we've had in 2012. Um, today, the star of our webinar, our featured guest is Reza Khalili, uh, which is a pseudonym. Uh, and Reza worked for the CIA inside Iran during the 80s and the 90s. He serves on the Task Force on National and Homeland Security and the Advisory Board of the Foundation for Democracy in Iran. Uh, we were first introduced to Reza during our filming of the award-winning film docu documentary Iranium. Uh, since that time, Reza has been on the forefront of broadcasting the ideological intentions of Iran's revolutionary regime and reporting advances in Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Reza has a book which I recommend highly to any, everybody to get. It's a time to betray the astonishing double life of a CIA agent inside the Revolutionary Guards of Iran. Uh, I want to thank you for um, having me. Uh, it's great to be here. And I want to thank you for uh, uh, setting up this webinar. Um, let me start by telling you a bit about myself. I was uh, born in Tehran, Iran, and raised in an upper middle class family. Uh, growing up in Tehran was wonderful, and it seemed that most Iranians were happy, hopeful, uh, and the country was progressing. Um, uh, this was life under the Shah. Uh, and at that time, it was a very open society. Women were free to do what they wanted. Religion was not an issue. Uh, and many Jews, Christians, and Muslims not only lived happily side by side, uh, but their friends and shared uh, mutual respect. And there were also many Americans living in Iran then, uh, and they were respected and treated uh, as uh, part of a big family. Living in Tehran then was like uh, living in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, apartment buildings were 30 stories high. Uh, uh, there were uh, uh, nightclubs, theaters, concerts, symphony, opera. Uh, and much more. Um, hundreds of colleges and universities across Iran provided education to tens of thousands of Iranian boys and girls. Um, I guess the only thing missing was lack of political freedom, uh, the freedom of speech, and many political parties objected to that and would not accept the rule of Shah uh, and his one-party system. And we did have uh, political prisoners, uh, but, but uh, uh, many of them are currently in charge of the brutal Islamic regime, and Shah did not eliminate them, uh, as they are doing to anyone opposing them ever since the revolution. Uh, so it was early 70s that uh, I came to America, uh, just like thousands of uh, other uh, Iranians, uh, to continue my education. Uh, my father wanted, to wanted me to come here and continue my education. And so uh, by the time I graduated, the revolution in Iran was taking place, uh, and uh, uh, Khomeini had basically become uh, the leader uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the revolution. 
uh, and uh, his promises uh, uh, were what uh, got the population uh, excited, even though uh, most Iranians had enjoyed uh, varying degrees of success under the Shah. Um, and, and so they were looking for political freedom, uh, and they believed that Ayatollah Khomeini could bring about full democracy and freedom, uh, and they really had no idea about Khomeini's philosophy of Islam and his beliefs which call for endless bloodshed uh, for glorification of Islam. Uh, his message was, uh, at that time, a nation that doesn't have freedom does not have civilization. A civilized nation is one that is free. Or, uh, in our government, uh, clergy will not govern, but help you with your spirituality. In our government, women will be free, and officials can be publicly criticized. Uh, so, uh, the whole nation was uh, uh, excited. Uh, uh, they were also incited by the leftists, the rightists, the national party. Uh, all the opposition had come together uh, uh, for this event. Um, so when the revolution took place, uh, shortly after uh, uh, I returned home, uh, excited, uh, believing that uh, I could help my country uh, with its progress. Uh, my childhood friend was part of the Revolutionary Guards uh, at its uh, initial inception, uh, and uh, they have been just organized uh, to protect the system and to uh, help the country, help the poor. And, uh, so uh, he asked me to join with my education and help him with the, uh, 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 with the organization, uh, which I did. Uh, but um, soon after the revolution and the formation of the Revolutionary Guards, uh, uh, more radical elements uh, consolidated power. And, and Khomeini went back on all of his promises. He had basically deceived uh, the Iranian nation. Uh, and so um, they put in place very harsh rules uh, to fully enforce Islamic laws. Uh, they formed the Komite, Revolutionary Police, Basij, uh, the volunteer force from brainwashed teenagers from villages, and the Ansar Hezbollah a radical gang of Islamists uh, sporting uniforms of dirty long beards and button-up shirts who roam the streets on motorcycles, brandishing sticks and chains, shouting, Allahu Akbar, Khomeini Rahbar, Khomeini is our leader, and attacking people who did not adhere strictly to Islamic rules. Then there were political imprisonment, torture and murder, uh, political parties were banned, uh, universities were shut down, and, and thousands ended up in Evan prison, uh, where they were tortured beyond anyone's imagination and executed, because as Khomeini believed, enemies of Islam had to be eliminated. Revolutionary courts were formed and mass executions took place. There was no trial, no defense, just the verdict by a clergy judge. Thousands were executed. Uh, I had become disillusioned after the U.S. embassy takeover, but became very puzzled and confused and angry uh, when I saw the treatment of the people by this radical minority. And I witnessed it firsthand, happening to my best friend and his siblings. Uh, the tortures were extreme, hanging one upside down with his hands and feet tied from behind them, uh, and then beating them with bats or cable, pulling off nails, breaking bones, uh, uh, raping girls before execution, believing virgins would go to heaven, therefore denying them that reward. And other methods of torture provided by KGB in Iran, uh, uh, they had a, KGB had a very close relationship with the guards in early years of the revolution uh, and, and influencing the events in Iran. And so uh, that's when uh, kind of my spy activities began. Um, I, I decided to come to U.S. and contact the U.S. authorities. Uh, I thought that uh, by, by, by letting the U.S. government know that this regime is not only a threat to the Iranian people but to the world, uh, that they would come to help. And so I managed to come to U.S., uh, contact the U.S. authorities, and, um, and met with uh, FBI agents, and, uh, and then they introduced me to a CIA officer. Uh, who uh, asked me if I was willing to become their eyes and ears in order to help my country. Uh, but they made it clear uh, that uh, it would be dangerous, uh, that should I get caught, that uh, uh, 
I would be on my own, and, and, and that was clear to me. Uh, and uh, so the relationship was based on honesty uh, and, uh, and, on, uh, and a mutual understanding. And, and throughout my career, they did everything that I had expected them to do. Uh, so I, I came back to Iran. I went back to Iran. I started my uh, espionage activity in the guards with the hope that the uh, information would save lives and, and that this regime uh, would be uh, uh, overthrown with the help of uh, uh, the West, the helping Iranian people. I reported um, uh, many events uh, of their offensive to capture Basra, that they were going to head fake to another front. Uh, and we recently learned through someone at Pentagon that uh, that specific cable ended up at Casper Weinberger's desk. And uh, another time I reported on Sandom's uh, pursuit of the nuclear bomb uh, and the guards' pursuit of the same. Uh, the intelligence of the guards had learned that uh, uh, Saddam was uh, looking to actually buy the bomb. And, and so uh, um, Mohsen Rezai, the chief commander of the guards, uh, contacted the uh, 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 wrote a letter actually to Ayatollah Khomeini, the supreme leader, asking for uh, uh, religious authority authorization uh, to start Iran's nuclear bomb project. So all this talk that the nuclear program is peaceful is totally bogus. It has started uh, for that purpose and uh, it, it continues on on that purpose. So at that time, they uh, contacted the Pakistani uh, officials. They met with AQ Khan and the Pakistani generals, offering billions of dollars to buy the bomb, but they ended up with centrifuges instead. And the first one uh, of these centrifuges were transported to Iran by Khomeini's private jet. Uh, and at the time, I reported on uh, China's involvement, that the guards were being t trained in China. Uh, an armament supplied by China, and this got a reaction by George Schultz, uh, uh, who openly objected to the Chinese. Uh, and, and so I was shocked that my reports were going in high, uh, to high ops. Uh, but uh, also I was shocked uh, when I learned that England and Germany were selling arms to uh, the guards, despite the arms embargo in place by President Reagan uh, and, and administration. Uh, and this all was going on when uh, negotiations by the West uh, was continuing on with the regime. Uh, uh, and, and this has been the case for 30 years. Uh, there's been so much negotiation, not only in the open, but behind the scenes uh, with the Mullahs, believing that they would uh, somehow change their behavior. And this has only emboldened these radicals who rule Iran, believing that the West is weak uh, and that uh, they can get away almost read anything. Also, while working with the agency in the guards, I was informed by my friends in the guards when McFarland traveled to Iran and met with Raf Sanjani. I was even told that the Americans had brought a cake, a Bible, and a gun as symbols along with arms on the plane. It was very disappointing to learn of that because I had hoped the U.S. would see the reality and help change it, but instead they were talking to these guys secretly. I later learned the U.S. government was meeting in private with the Revolutionary Guards, uh, one of them, the same guy who had facilitated the kidnapping of William Buckley, uh, the CIA chief in Beirut, uh, and they were meeting with these guys in Geneva, Brussels, Frankfurt, and Mainz, and other places, and they were negotiating with two asso close associates of Hashim Iraq Sanjani, who were given the code names, the engine, and the relative. And later on, the relative was facilitated by Oliver North to come to Washington, D.C., and given a tour of the White House. Uh, so this was very disappointing. And all the while, the regime assassination of opposition and terrorist activity was going on. Uh, the Marine Barracks bombing were uh, even more than Rafiq, was the first minister of the Revolutionary Guards, openly stated that the attack on the Marine Barracks uh, was done by Iran. Also later on, uh, uh, the, the event, uh, the, the bombing of Kobar uh, bombings, uh, where our intelligence agencies know that it was done by Iran. Um, and the Pan Am bombing, which I even reported while I was working in Europe for the agency, uh, then I learned from the um, 
Iranian agents who had traveled there, uh, that uh, it was on the order of the uh, Iranian regime. Uh, they provided some information that was not public. I passed it uh, on to the agency. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, Iran had subcontracted this uh, uh, bombing to the Palestinian front then on to the uh, uh, Libyans, but it was ordered by the Iranians. Uh, and, uh, and, and most disgracing was when I learned that France, Germany, and England had even agreed uh, in the 80s uh, in an unwritten pact, which I reported to the agency then, to allow the guards agents to assassinate the opposition members in their respective countries as long as they did not harm uh, their citizens. Uh, and so hundreds were assassinated in Europe. Now, uh, the radicals who rule Iran and are uh, currently in charge, uh, we could understand that they are true believers of Islam and take everything literally from the Quran. Martyrdom is welcomed with open arms. Uh, they believe that the Islamic regime was put in place by Allah and that the end of days are at hand. They study the hadiths, a century old sayings by Prophet Muhammad and his kings and are more in line with the theology of Ayatollah Mesbayazdi, uh, a member of the Assembly of Experts, uh, which is the body that chooses the Supreme Leader. Uh, Mesbayazdi runs the Hakmani school that teaches the most radical Shiites belief, including the belief in the imminent coming of the 12th Imam, Imam Mahdi. The teachers and security, uh, the teachers and the students of this school run some of the most important political and security institution in the Iranian government, including the Ministry of Intelligence. Every minister has been associated with the Hapani school and involved in organizing death squads to kill the opposition and coordinating terrorist activities against the West. Ayatollah Jannati, the powerful chairman of the Guardian Council, is also associated with that school. So their mission is to create the circumstances needed for the coming of the last Messiah. Uh, they believe that Ayatollah Khamenei is the same person called in Hadith from hundreds of years ago who was raised in the Khurasan province and takes the helm of the Islamic movement before the reappearance of Imam Mahdi, the 12th Shiite Imam. They believe Hassan Nasrullah is another key figure. In their belief, one of the most important events, securing the reappearance of the last Messiah, uh, as called in the Hadith, is the annihilation of Israel and conquering of Beit al-Muqaddas, Jerusalem. Uh, in their eyes, uh, this would trigger the coming, and that Islam will soon conquer the world, and infidels will be destroyed. And actually, Ayatollah Khaz Ali, another member of the Assembly of Experts, just recently, days ago literally, stated that the coming is upon us, and it's very, very uh, uh, soon. Other key figures have said that, and I urge everyone to go to my website, thetimetobetray.com, and watch the documentary, The Coming is Upon Us, which was produced in Iran by the regime, and I revealed it uh, uh, last year, I believe. So with that goal, the regime is preparing for war. After the appointment of Major General Mohammad uh, Ali Jafari to the chief commander of the uh, Revolutionary Guards by the Supreme Leader, Khamenei, uh, the guards have facilitated the establishment of 32 command and control centers in and around Iran that can operate independently in case of a break in communication during the war. Each center is authorized to suppress any unrest and to confront any enemy. Uh, the besieged militia forces have also been armed with heavy armaments. They know that in any war, their line of communication is going to be a target. And, and with lack of communication uh, from the command and control, they have established all these separate command and controls with independent authority uh, to take action. And then over 6,000 fast respond Beit al Muqaddas Jerusalem battalions have been formed within the besieged forces to enhance defense capabilities and to suppress uprising and defend against enemy. Assassin teams have been formed to eliminate political and human rights activities, uh, activists in case of war. Uh, so if the war takes place, they're going to kill all the activists uh, to make sure nobody is there to lead an uprising. The girls have also mapped out an extensive list of U.S. bases in the Middle East to attack with their missiles, uh, disrupting the movement of U.S. forces 
and the operation of the Air Force, which the Guards believe will be the main thrust of any attack by America. The bases identified can be attacked either by short-range uh, rockets with a range of up to 140 miles or with ballistic missiles with a range of more than 1,200 miles, which would cover all of U.S. bases in the region and even in Europe. Uh, missiles are also pre-targeted at Saudi Arabia, oil fields, uh, Riyadh, Bahrain, other countries in the region, and Israel. And they know that uh, disrupting the flow of oil uh, would harm uh, the West and its economy. And so uh, they will uh, take action and they are threatening to do that in order uh, for the West to understand not to attack Iranian nuclear facilities. Now the nuclear bomb program, as I said earlier, uh, started um, in the mid-80s after the Iranian government uh, got the blueprint uh, on the nuclear bomb project, AQ Khan and the Pakistani uh, 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 officials allowed uh, this information to be passed on. Uh, AQ Khan himself traveled to Iran several times helping with the project. Uh, at the same time, thousands of Iranian students were sent abroad for nuclear-related studies. Uh, the Iranian officials also urged uh, other nuclear scientists uh, to come to Iran with many incentives. They've hired Russians and others and many uh, Iranians. Now, the Iranian regime also engaged in nuclear work in collaboration with Argentina, China, North Korea, Brazil, Russia, and others. Uh, late 80s to early 90s, uh, when I was working in Europe for the agency, two Iranian agents contacted me uh, as I was playing my part, infiltrating them uh, to buy a specific part, uh, which then uh, I learned it was uh, for the use of uh, a, a nuclear weapon program, high precision machineries. Uh, a few years uh, after that, uh, uh, and I reported that to the agency. Um, it was early 90s, a few years later, the agency asked me to look for an Iranian scientist who would be willing to testify that Iran had the nuclear bomb. Uh, and so at that time, uh, even the U.S. government was aware of their activities. Uh, and and, and, and uh, yet, uh, to this day, uh, we fail to make it clear to the public that they are getting the bomb or they do have it. Actually, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it was known in the inter community that the Iranian agents were visiting nuclear installations throughout former Soviet Union and particular interest in Kazakhstan, uh, which not only had the warhead but also massive stock of bomb-grade bomb uranium and plutonium. Kazakhstan, predominantly a Muslim uh, country, was quoted by the Iranian agents and offers uh, of hundreds of millions of dollars for the bomb. And, 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 and later on, reports surfaced that three nuclear warheads were missing. This was corroborated by Russian General Viktor Samoylov, uh, who handled the disarmament issues for the general staff. And, and another uh, individual uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, he was contracted by the U.S. Department and uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, 2008, in a briefing on Iran at the State Department, uh, the, the department's Middle East expert told the group that it was common knowledge that Iran had acquired tactical nuclear weapons from one or more of former Soviet republics. Uh, using the vague term common knowledge allowed the expert to discuss the information in an unclassified uh, presentation. And meanwhile, Paul Munzerman, uh, the voice President of German Federal Intelligence Service then said that Iran had received two of the three nuclear warheads. Uh, my source in the Revolutionary Guards verified that, that they had them, but there was no verification that they had the codes or these, if these were workable warheads. However, the source verified that the guards do have neutron bombs uh, and were working on an electromagnetic pulse attack which if launched could, uh, on U.S., it could send us back to the 18th century overnight. I reported uh, last year that uh, the guards had armed their ships uh, with long-range ballistic missiles and that they were going to soon uh, travel to the Atlantic Ocean and, and uh, that would put them within range of attacking um, uh, U.S. Uh, homeland. Uh, it's a single detonation of nuclear warheads at the right altitude over the right place uh, uh, over U.S. could create that electromagnetic pulse attack. And actually, uh, uh, just just recently, 
the Revolutionary Guards commanded a uh, commander stated that soon the ships will travel to the Atlantic Ocean uh, to keep peace and within international laws. So the threat is going to go by multiple. Uh, and this is uh, at the same time that they're working on intercontinental ballistic missiles. I, uh, my sources tell me that despite the belief in the West that Iran will not have intercontinental ballistic missile before 2015, they will have it next year. Uh, and unfortunately, all of U.S. will uh, become uh, uh, within their range. Uh, and also, another activity uh, that uh, is quite alarming and I recently revealed is the work on uh, biological warheads. Uh, I was informed and I put this out that uh, they, have, uh, they are working on microbial uh, micro agents. Uh, and they have armed 37 of their ballistic missiles uh, with uh, bioweapons. And the four agents that they have uh, produced is anthrax, encephalitis, which they got uh, from Venezuela, that's the Venezuelan equine encephalitis, yellow grain, that's, that's an agent they have made with the collaboration of North Korea, uh, and they have named it that. And the fourth agent, which I just uh, re uh, reviewed, was uh, SARS. Uh, and the fact that they have on their ballistic missiles is quite dangerous because a, a small quantity of this uh, agent could kill hundreds of thousands. And some of these ballistic missiles are aimed at Israel. And their activities uh, on the nuclear bomb, which I again uh, recently reviewed, is that uh, they're working clandestinely from several sites unknown to the IAEA. One of them uh, is in the outskirts of Najafabad in Esfahan. Um, this site operates under the control of the Revolutionary Guards on the research and development of nuclear uh, weapons, both uranium and plutonium. Uh, their activities include enriching uranium to weapons grade, uh, testing a neutron detonator and implosion system, uh, and as a result of this research at this facility, a test was done out of Iran's Pachin military with high explosives, which the IAEA has requested for several months to visit, uh, but the, uh, the regime has denied them this visit while cleaning the site. They're working on designing and building a nuclear warhead to arm Iran's Shahab-3 ballistic missile, separating plutonium for a plutonium implosion type uh, fission bomb, uh, as Iran's heavy reactor, a uh, water reactor, is becoming operational very, very soon in Iraq. And that alone could produce enough plutonium for tens of plutonium bombs. Most troubling, though, uh, is that um, uh, information coming from a senior officer in the regime's intelligence who is now out of the country, and that is that the regime, with the help of North Koreans, has tested a uh, uh, plutonium bomb in Iran. Uh, by decoupling it, uh, they can test the lower grade uh, bomb without uh, the world uh, 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 realizing it, uh, and they say that these tests have been done and they have reached, received enough plutonium for two nuclear bombs. The source, uh, the source indicated that the IEA is completely on the wrong track, chasing shadows by focusing on Natanz and Fargo, as the regime is working out of these uh, sites, both on uranium and plutonium. So the regime ha has set up three levels of activity on the nuclear uh, program, so if one is revealed, the other is uh, 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 parallelly uh, continuing the work. Uh, they're literally working around the clock, uh, and despite uh, intelligence reports that, uh, uh, you know, that they are not close, uh, the sources tell me that they have crossed the red line. And currently both Russian and North Korean advisors and military personnel are in Iran helping them with these projects. Now, regime goals for the region and the world, uh, as I revealed several months ago, the regime has openly confessed to, uh, 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 to the fact that, and this is what they say, they've said that the most important fact uh, that America and the West have continuously missed is the ideology behind Iran's destiny. Its doctrine knows no boundaries, and it stands in diametric opposition to and defiance of the most basic principles and fundamental forms taken by Western civilization. So basically, their ideology, they're saying it openly, there is no change of behavior. They stand, and their doctrine stands against most basic principles and fundamentals by Western civilization. 
and they say combating Israel and staying on top of all that has the stench of Americani or the fuels that fill the uh, vital engine of revolutionary Islam in the Middle East. So the fuel for their belief uh, is, is, is combating U.S. and Israel. Uh, and, and they stand against everything that the West stands for. Uh, so they believe that the current situation in the Middle East is a sign that the final victory is at hand, and they have been preparing for this day. They just said that the second phase of Islamic awakening is on its way. So we should watch for unraveling in Jordan, in Bahrain, in Yemen, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and others. Uh, and uh, and to, to emphasize on this fact uh, with their ideology, I've got to say that several years ago they distributed a book to their forces which was published uh, by the Revolutionary Guards in 2003, which is called The Last Six Months. The book describes the conditions needed in the last six months prior to the reappearance of the last Islamic Messiah. Um, the book relies on uh, the centuries-old Hazis, describes, uh, which describes the significant signs that would launch the six-month time frame for the re reappearance of Mahdi, and, and, and an attack on Syria and then on Iran is expected uh, per their uh, understanding. In their mind, all the events have taken place, and the only missing part uh, is total chaos, and a complete breakdown in global economy, where one third of the world population dies from nuclear wars and the rest finds no sanctuary. And so these are the people uh, who are uh, ruling Iran. And not only they have taken hostage the Iranian people, but the world. And so excited by the uh, recent events in the Middle East, uh, uh, the radicals ruling Iran have stated that the final chapter has begun and soon the forces of Hezbollah, party of God, will engage the forces of party of evil. And we have to take this threat seriously. And, and again, I revealed days ago that they've sent terror teams into U.S., um, France, Germany, uh, in, in the Persian Gulf region, uh, waiting for the order. Uh, to start uh, committing terrorist acts, to disrupting uh, uh, the economy, uh, to create fear and terror uh, within those countries uh, and many more uh, in order to create that circumstance. So, so a major confrontation is at hand if you don't understand the threat. And, and that's why we need to realize that the people of Iran are our best chance to bring change in that country uh, and that uh, um, uh, we need to take action in helping them with their aspirations for freedom. Uh, with the current climate in the Middle East, it is of utmost importance to let the Iranians know that we are on their side and that we will not tolerate this criminal regime anymore and apply much more pressure on the Iranian official, which will then widen the existing crack and will result in many of the loyalists jumping ship and emboldening Iranians to overthrow this regime. You see, what you witness uh, uh, happening on the streets of Tehran in 2009 and throughout Iran is nothing new. Ever since the early 80s, just a couple of years into the revolution, the Iranians have been pushing for freedom, for democracy, and they've been paying dearly for that. The Iranians are one of the most progressive nations in the Middle East, but through suppression by the Islamic fanatics ruling the country, their voices have been shut before it could reach out to the world. Today, they look to us for help, and as the regime inches ever closest to uh, arming their missiles with nuclear bombs, helping Iranians will not only serve humanity, but it is a vital national security interest of ours, and world stability relies on it. Thank you so much for having me, uh, and God bless you all. Uh, we do have some questions for you. The first question I'll ask Reza is, what is the actual ratio of enrichment that Iran is reaching till now, and how much time does Iran need to construct its atomic bomb in the case that enrichment has the required ratio? Well, officially in the open, uh, IAEA has verified that they've been reached to 20% level. Now, you better understand that in reaching to 20% level, it's a breakthrough, a major breakthrough, because you've gone eighth of the way to weaponization. All they need to do is spin the 20% for a few weeks more, four to six weeks more, and then get that purity of 90%. But 
according to a source involved with the uh, uh, regime's atomic project, who has just left, they have enriched to 90%. I said this in 2010, before the Iranian regime broke the news that they had enriched to 20%. They have enriched to weaponization. They are working out of secret sites. Um, how close they are? Um, some information say that they already have it, but the problem is of uh, tipping their ballistic missiles with the nuclear uh, bomb, and uh, they could uh, they could overcome that technicality uh, very very soon. I have another question here asking: From what sources do you continue to receive your information? Well, if you follow me on my website at timetobetray.com. Uh, you can see all my special reports, articles, interviews, and news that I put up daily. There are several sources that uh, um, I maintain contact with, um, some in the Revolutionary Guard, some in the Intelligence Ministry, uh, even as close as Khamenei's office. And routinely, uh, we get information verification, and we put out the news. Some of the news goes to the authorities. And, 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 and uh, some of them are made public. Actually, very soon I will reveal uh, uh, another site uh, which they are working on uh, bioweapons at, at this specific site. I think another question here which I'm seeing from a few different readers is why do you think that uh, Western foreign policy, particularly American foreign policy, has misunderstood this regime for so long? Well, all you need to do is listen to Mr. Brzezinski, uh, who for a long time, along with a whole lot of other people in D.C., uh, advised um, President Obama and, uh, and, uh, uh, to negotiate, believing that the regime in Iran is a rational regime, that it wants to survive, uh, that at, at the right price they will change direction. And now that they have failed with that argument, giving Iran enough time to uh, build anything it wants uh, and become invincible, um, now Mr. Brzezinski is advising that a nuclear armed Iran won't be so bad because it's, uh, they will uh, map policy with, uh, uh, would uh, work here, mutually assured destruction. Uh, we did this with the Soviet Union, he says, and we can do it with the Islamic regime. You see, they don't understand the ideology. It's not about the economy. It's the ideology. And Iran is not North Korea. It's not Soviet Union. The regime that rules Iran believes it's deeply uh, 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 rooted with this belief of, of justification uh, by the reappearance of the last Shiite Imam. Uh, they believe that they can, uh, that the time has arrived for Islam to conquer the world. And even if you don't believe that they are like that, I mean, how can we allow a radical regime who suppresses its people, who has armed Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Hamas, collaborated with Chavez, expanding terror ne network around the world, drug trafficking, money laundering, working with the mobs, proliferation of arms, how can we allow them to get the bomb? It will become a nightmare. The world will become unstable. We won't know what's going to happen the next day. And plus, is Israel going to tolerate that? Would Israel know that it's going to exist the next day? So these uh, talks by Mr. Brzezinski and others are um, uh, delusional at best. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, it's going to create a, a, a situation where uh, humanity will be endangered and the stability of world peace and global economy will be endangered. Tell me, you know, which percentage of the Iranian people actually want their country to become a nuclear superpower and uh, the sort of state of the opposition inside Iran with regard to uh, taking back their country from the hands of the revolutionary regime? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, you see, majority of Iranians, uh, and this is what the West needs to understand, majority of Iranians resent this regime and the ideology, ideology it preaches. They've been fighting for over three decades. All the prisons across Iran are filled to the brim. This is, this is a statement by the uh, Justice Department of the Islamic regime. And, and so they're 
they're hoping and they're counting uh, the time to, to, for the overthrow of this regime to become free, to have full democracy and freedom. And also, there is a huge dissatisfaction within the loyal forces even, within the revolutionary guards, within the agents uh, in the intelligence ministry. So many of them have defected, but the West has not provided uh, a, a, a direct channel for defection. If it did, if it announced that anyone who doesn't have the blood uh, of the Iranian people on their hand and leave with information, we will welcome them with open arms. Many would leave. This regime would collapse on its own. Uh, there is so much dissatisfaction with the regime. And the opposition in Iran, um, and basically uh, some of the opposition uh, 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 are uh, silenced. Uh, under house arrest, uh, much of them are in, in uh, prisons, at Evan prison, but the majority of the people are looking uh, for an opportunity, including members of the Revolutionary Guards, and I've revealed that, uh, and a uh, majority of the uh, uh, forces in the army are looking for an opportunity to get rid of this regime. Now, all this talk that the Iranians uh, support the nuclear program, this is a propaganda that has been formed by the Ministry of Intelligence and sold to the Western media, that this is a national pride, that they rally around this idea. People don't have food to eat. They're being lashed, women are being lashed for not adhering to Islamic hijab. Boys and girls are being rounded up in colleges and universities for talking against the regime. Workers are striking every day and protesting for uh, lack of uh, pay. Uh, there is a mayhem in there. Uh, and, and, and so Iranians care less about the nuclear program. Uh, and and uh, what needs to be said here is that they want this regime gone. They came out in 2009. We did not help them. Well, Reza, I want to thank you once again. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining in with us today. Um, please, if you are not a member of our, of our newsletter, you can subscribe to radicalislam.org uh, slash subscribe. Um, I encourage all of you to watch the film Iranium. You can go to www.iraniumthemovie.com to watch the film. You can also see all of our films, Obsession, The Third Jihad, and Iranium on YouTube. Uh, you can get Reza's book, A Time to Betray, at www.atimetobetray.org, uh, rather, atimetobetray.com. Uh, thank you again so much for participating. We look forward to having you at our next webinar. Of course, Clarion Fund is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, and our films are made in this webinar series, and our websites are made from donations uh, from uh, loyal subscribers like yourselves. Uh, you can make a small donation and your donation at www.radicalism.org. And I would like to wish everybody a great afternoon and a happy holiday season. Look forward to see, speaking with you in the next webinar. Thank you so much.